So as far as disclosures, this is actually the one that should have been in yesterday's. The only update is that we're now, what, four hours away from Legoland, so that <laughs> there's palpable excitement that I left in my hotel room with my <laughs> six-year-old. Can we go yet? Oh, you have to go work. Sorry. So anyway. Um, but yeah, so what I wanted to do relatively quickly, is, as uh, Amy had said, I'll, I'll give you more of a broad view uh, of dissemination implementation research and opportunities at, at NIH. Um, but I did want to start out by saying at least where we started thinking about this problem at NIMH, and something that we thought, as we heard yesterday, is quite common across health, but just to give you a little bit of the picture of it, i tell you a little bit about where we are in terms of some of our NIH offer, uh, efforts. Um, and then, you know, ideally we're working together to try and improve this connection between research and practice. Um, so you may not be able to see this all that well in terms of contrast, but what this shows is that, you know, emphasized by these um, shaded in uh, silhouettes, is that there's 60 million people in the U.S. with any mental disorder, 11 to 17 million approximately, have serious or, or severe mental illness. Of those, less than half get any services whatsoever. Um, of that, maybe a third would get what be, would be considered services of sufficient quality. Most of the action is at this bottom part of saying, of those who receive care, how many of them within trials are fully benefiting, you know, in, in most cases only, a, only say a third are fully benefiting from our existing treatments even in, in, in trials, that uh, some, another third are sort of partially benefiting, and even in the best available care there are a third who really don't benefit at all. The challenge is that so much of our effort historically has been on that smallest slice, that even if you got everyone who's receiving acceptable care to get good care and to benefit from it, you're already missing 85% of the people's needs, uh, at least in the country. And so what we, what we recognize is that the implementation problem, really at least at the population health level, overwhelms the other impact that we might be able to achieve through some of our other kinds of research. And so we see this as a tremendous opportunity to really drive huge improvements in population health. And that's why we're very excited about the abilities of, of you and others to try and advance knowledge in this field because it shouldn't be the case that you only have a 15% chance of getting quality care. It shouldn't be the case that you have less than 50% uh, you know, chance of receiving any services. And so this is really our mandate. Um, how far have we come? Well, in 2001, when I got to NIH, there was tremendous variability in terms of a lot of people speaking past each other in terms of what this challenge of, of dissemination and implementation was all about. There, were very, there was very little awareness that these were actually research questions. The prevailing thing was, don't they just read my papers? Don't they just do what I've said? Why isn't the world changing the way I would like them to, to, to change? Um, there was minimal capacity within the field to really think about this systematically and scientifically. There wasn't a shared vision, certainly at NIH, about how we could try and bridge these gaps. Uh, at the time, there were few opportunities to present and publish. We heard from many of our investigators who felt like they had learned a tremendous amount about trying and in some cases failing to implement effective practices in care um, that they couldn't even publish the most interesting findings because sometimes they were negative and who wants to publish a negative finding? The commentaries were abundant. So there were a, a large number of people who were saying, this is a problem, we've got to do something about it. There were so many uh, commentaries that it actually outpaced the number of studies that were in the field trying to systematically look at these efforts to implement. And it really wasn't a clear part of our research agenda. It was, as I said, assumed to be this handoff point. The first thing that we felt very clearly needed to be done, at least for our purposes, was to come up with what we saw as working definitions. So at least where NIH, or at least the, the institutes involved in these efforts were concerned, we could say, here is how we're identifying these challenges. It didn't mean, and it still doesn't mean, that anyone in the field has to use, be a slave to these particular definitions. But rather what it meant was, at least you'll know where we're coming from. And so if this is the kind of thing that you're interested in, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll understand how we're defining it. In addition, what we encouraged is that if people found other definitions or are using other terms, that it would be really, really helpful if across the field people were saying, defining what they meant. So rather than people using uh, things that they said were synonyms that weren't actually synonyms or defining things in different ways, at least we could come up with some shared language. We define dissemination to be about this distri distribution, this spread of information and intervention materials to specific audiences. This idea that you were trying to transmit 
and ideally have that message packaged in a nice way, received and actually used in some capacity. Where we contrasted that with implementation, we saw a much more intensive strategy of how, how do you integrate uh, interventions within specific health settings and how do you change practice patterns within those health and community and, and other service systems. Uh, we didn't come at this alone. Uh, Jonathan Lomas from Canada had done this wonderful paper defining diffusion, dissemination, and implementation in the context of knowledge transfer. And we really did adapt those definitions because we thought that they did a nice job of talking about different levels of intensity with which you're trying to inform and ultimately change practice. As Enola had presented, we were very, uh, she, so she presented a variant of this slide. We've presented together, so each of us, I think, have changed the animation slightly in this. <laughs> but what she presented yesterday was this notion of what we usually see, right, where we're usually testing these interventions on one end and driving directly to health outcomes, and that what we were missing was all of these potential cascading outcomes in between. And so what we saw as the core of implementation science being the how, how do you identify these implementation strategies that really have an ability to improve the feasibility of, of, of uptake of a particular intervention, the, the fidelity to that, the penetration through a system, uh, sustainability over time, the costs associated with implementation. But actually, what we more broadly see is that this entire picture is where implementation science needs to go. It needs to ultimately result in improved health outcomes. Otherwise, why are we bothering, right? We, if we get something in place that has no impact whatsoever on people's lives, then we're really not doing what we set out to do. And so while we saw that core of implementation around to some degree, this prospective test of a strategy and this resultant implementation outcomes, what we really want to see is that knock-on effect. How is it improving the efficiency and the quality um, and accessibility of services? And how is it ultimately driving improvements, both symptomatic, functional, and even just other associated satisfaction and other things to make people's lives better? And that we remain seeing as our core mission in terms of uh, implementation science. So we set out uh, first starting with an NIMH, a mental health centered uh, program announcement, to then work with other, agents, uh, other institutes within the agency around a broader program announcement. So the first time around, we had eight other NIH institutes, which was more than we expected, um, who all said, you know what, this makes sense to us. Our investigators are struggling, whether it's cardiovascular or cancer or substance abuse, et cetera. We're all struggling with the same problem of the limited uptake of things that we've seen again and again through uh, RCTs, through, um, uh, through meta-analyses as being effective, but are not getting out there. Um, when we released this, this was in late 2005, over the next three years, we saw a nice growth in the portfolio. We saw 40 projects that ranged from being the, the small R03s to the sort of middle-sized developmental R21s to the large R01s. We were encouraged that there was a continuum of intervention types. There were treatment studies, uh, implementation studies, there were prevention studies, there were screening. They covered both clinical and community settings. Most of the studies were prospective. We did see that the primary, the modal application that we were seeing was, how do we get this particular intervention into this particular setting? Which was a good start, and there were a variance of approaches, which we also liked to try and accomplish this. We didn't want to see that everyone's using the exact same approach, and so we learned nothing more than the effectiveness of that approach. Uh, the second time around, we added another uh, four institutes. So at this point, we had 12 of the NIH institutes and centers involved. Um, again, we had ultimately, I think it was 46 projects that were funded. We saw enhanced focus on sustainability, which as we talked about yesterday, at least we see is very important. We saw some nice focus on improved measurement within the field. Uh, again, we saw a continuum of intervention types. We saw more clinical topics um, covered. So we started to see applications and awards being made in dental and craniofacial research, which hadn't been a part of, of our portfolio before. Complementary and alternative medicine. And helpfully, thinking about patients who are dealing with multiple problems at once, not just the single disorder that, that, that may be limiting. We also saw a nice range of designs. We saw experimental, we saw quasi-experimental, we saw observational. Not every trial that went through and was successful looked like a sort of simple double-blind RCT. We were seeing a nice range, and the key thing that, in, uh, that the reviewers were, were saying was, we want the design to be as rigorous 
as possible, but as relevant to the circumstances as possible. So it wasn't this one size fits all, but it was the nuanced, how do we match the question that they're asking with the right design given the circumstances? So what we saw out of these, uh, these sort of 86, I think, at this point grants were a lot of studies that were looking at the effectiveness of different approaches to implementation. Quality improvement approaches, approaches as, as Greg had talked about yesterday, trying to change the organization structure, climate, culture. We saw a number of ones and, and, and still see that today that are focusing on the best way to try and train providers and provide supervision for ongoing sort of quality assessment and improvement. Uh, and we saw a, no, a number of them that were focusing on how do we change policy or practice at higher and higher levels and how do we change financing models, which I know was discussed yesterday, to try and make reimbursement more of a, of, of, of a reality in some cases where traditional funding uh, methods have not worked very well. We also have seen some emerging approaches which have been well used in practice but not necessarily as well researched. So we're starting to see more work looking systematically at learning collaboratives which have been very popular, popularized by the uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement and others, but we don't actually have as much data on what impact do they provide. And then more using technology as supports to try and uh, have implementation uh, exist and be successful for given practices. We have more to come, and this is where you come in. We really do have a lot more work to do. We have current program announcements. Now we have 15 institutes and centers that are involved. You'll see the, uh, the acronyms, the, the sort of word salad. But it basically covers across NIH most every institute where they're focusing on directly the patient as the end, right? There are some of our institutes that are much more basic science driven. A lot of our institutes cut across basic to clinical and into services, and these are the ones who are represented. So you'll see, as Amy said, NIDCD. Uh, you'll see it covers mental health and cancer and substance abuse, aging. The Human Genome Research Institute joined forces because they're recognizing that as there's advances in genomic medicine, there's not as much understanding about how best to integrate with that within clinical care. And this is an area that uh, research has been exploding in, but has it actually reached the individual who could benefit from it. In many cases, no, it's still sort of on the horizon. Uh, the other thing that we negotiated successfully for, and we felt like we were a few years ahead of schedule, is that the Center for Scientific Review said, we know that there needs to be special expertise to review these applications. When we had the first couple of rounds of the program announcement, we had uh, special emphasis panels, which were like a new study section every round. And they decided that this was one area that NIH needed a more standing, consistent review process for. And so in 2010, they created the Dissemination and Implementation Research in Health, DIRH, study section, which remains the place where if you uh, apply through these program announcements, it will always go to that uh, study section. We used to have every other round submission, but again, there was a recognition at NIH that there's enough demand, there are enough applications coming in that justify that each and every round we would have the opportunity to make sure that things came in. So just a few of the themes, you, you can obviously look at the program announcements, which again have RO3s, the small grant, R21s, the, the developmental ones, and then the larger RO1s. But some of the themes that we wanted to spotlight, because we definitely need more, are things related to improving sustainability and ongoing improvement of, of interventions, exactly what I was trying to say in, in, in some way uh, in yesterday's talk. Uh, we want more of an emphasis on not just thinking about the individual intervention, but how you can take multiple interventions and create an evidence-based care system. Because we know that going one intervention at a time within a study or even in practice is not very efficient and probably not meeting people's needs. We really do need, for any of you who are on the methodological side, we really do need more development and actually use of, of new designs and new measures. Um, as was said uh, yesterday, I think An Enola had mentioned it, there have been a couple of efforts to try and pull together existing measures. We've recognized that there are still uh, gaps in that. And so where you're thinking about a construct that's not well measured, that's a very uh, effective way to use the program announcements and it will help us all. Um, we've gotten more interested in modeling approaches and other system science approaches to dissemination implementation, trying to look at how you estimate impact and look at available data to tell you which kind of strategy might be better than others, and that's very well encouraged. And more and more we're recognizing that if we just focus domestically, we may be missing out on tremendous opportunities to learn. And so seeing more implementation science in that global health context is absolutely encouraged. 
Uh, in fact, some of the program announcements will say this is only open to domestic institutions or domestic investigations. Uh, this is one that's open much more broadly. And what you need to do is say, how is the knowledge going to be relevant in the US? But in our experience, there's such diversity in this country that it hasn't been all that difficult to say how this kind of context could give us some information on what happens in the US. Um, so as I said, there's the study section. Uh, you'll see, hopefully, on your, on your sheets the, the link to the ongoing roster, where, again, you should be aware of who's reviewing the applications. And like I said, if you feel like there's a gap, you can absolutely add to it. Martha Hare, who's the scientific review officer, will routinely connect with program to say, what do you think? How's it going? Do you feel like there are other areas of expertise we should get on? Um, you know, get on the committee. And, and we've had a really nice opportunity to help inform that committee so that they're as current as possible in terms of where the field is moving. Um, so just to leave you with, there's a number of resources. I think what you probably have seen over the last couple days is a tremendous amount of information thrown at you. And if you're newer to this area, it's pretty hard to say, what should I attend to? We've tried to make as many of these resources available uh, as possible. So there's certainly access to the funded grants. We have a couple of, of websites, OBSSR uh, and the National Cancer Institute actually publish uh, lists and links to abstracts of everything that's been funded in this space. We now have research centers, we have CTSA cores, we have research networks that are devoted to uh, dissemination and implementation. ANOLA's Implementation Research Institute has been a way to train folks in mental health. The OBSSR-led Summer Training Institute, which yesterday, and maybe it's still around today, we had, we had distributed a flyer. If anyone is interested in attending that, April 6th, I think, is the deadline. Um, and all of the materials, even if you can't spare the week to join us, all of the materials from the first three years are available online. So in every case, we've made the slides that we've presented available. And in a lot of cases, we've made the videos of the talks available for anyone to use. And the goal of it really is that other people use it. So the whole philosophy of the Titer Training Institute is of a train-the-trainer model. And we're really looking for people who may not have a lot of uh, sort of collaborators locally to help to build that, to build capacity within your local institutions. So we think that's hopefully in its fourth year a, a, a good opportunity to keep that going. Uh, thanks to Brian Mittman um, and, and others, over recent years there has been a, a premier journal called Implementation Science where people had said, well, where do I publish something about implementation? It's pretty clear from the title <laughs> that this is a pretty good one. And then, as was referenced yesterday, uh, Ross Browns and Graham Kolditz and Enola had, had pulled together this volume a couple of years ago, which really does represent a lot of the key advances over the last 10 years in the field. And so if you haven't seen uh, this volume, at least you know, take a look at some of the chapters from it. It might be a nice way to getting further orientation than you can possibly get uh, sitting through this probably you know, tiring uh, set of PowerPoint slides. Um, the one last thing that we've done uh, over recent years is tried to uh, come up with a venue for people who are new to the field and experienced to get together with uh, its NIH and the VA have been involved in this. We had five large meetings um, that, that really grew, as you can see, started out with about 300 people. By the fifth meeting, we were at 1,200 registrants, and we had outgrown the initial place where we had held the meeting. The sixth meeting, what we've done instead of doing these large meetings after five, was we've had these smaller working groups because the goal is to continue to build capacity around training, around measurement and research design. So in the coming months, ideally, we'll have more of the, the dissemination, the products, from those meetings out to the field to be able to learn from. But it's really leveraging a lot of wonderful people's efforts around improving measurement, around being uh, thoughtful and innovative with research design, and on what are the kinds of training materials that can be available for some of you who are new to the field or others who can be teachers uh, of this work to others. Um, so I'm done. You'll see my email address and my phone number. I do answer it, so it doesn't go anywhere else. So feel free to pick up the phone and call. I do answer my email, so feel free to, uh, to, to, to send it that way. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Do we have, we have time for, yeah. okay. So we have time for a couple, and then we'll sit in these easy chairs. So any questions? I got a question. Yeah. Um, well, um, are other institutes joining the program and dissemination? So NICHD, for example, are they? So it's a very good question and a very specific question um, that involves members of NICHD who I can't represent. Um, 
So, so, so there have been, there, there are a couple of different ways in which we've seen institutes engage in this. Uh, like I said, 15 of them have signed on directly to the program announcements. There are others who have some level of enthusiasm, but each institute has a different way of thinking about how they publicize their research priorities. To this point, NICHD has not signed on. But I think certainly in the global space, They've had a lot of interest in implementation. They've had this maternal child implementation network, basically. And I participated with them in pulling together the field to think about what's the priority on the international side. I think domestically, it's been a little bit unclear. They funded some of the, there actually are funded studies in implementation that NICHD has supported, um, but they're not on the program announcement. What is nice about DIRH, which wasn't the case when it was a special emphasis panel, is because it's a standing committee, even if you submit investigator initiated, so not through a program announcement, there is the ability to have that same review at DIRH. The key thing with any institute, NICHD or whatever else, is to get in touch with a program contact. And I'm very happy if people have, if they don't see the institute on the list, and they have ideas that they think are relevant to, I'm very happy to work with you to find the right contact. So we have a few key staff people at NICHD who have been involved, um, and they've actually been involved in planning our annual meetings. But to this point, the Institute has not chosen to sign on. Hi, Kathy Binger from the University of New Mexico. Um, is, is this on? I can't tell. Yeah. Okay. Um, as I'm sitting here thinking about conceptualizing projects that would fit into this, and as we've talked the last few days, we've talked about how dissemination and implementation fits into the whole process. So I'm thinking that there may be, there must be lots of projects that come through that have components that fit into our typical study section as well as into DNI. So I'm wondering if you have any suggestions or thoughts about that and framing projects and making sure they go to the right place, all those kinds of things. Yeah, so I think it's a, it's a very good question. The more general answer is that this is why it's so good to connect with program prior to submission, because I think program who often have applications scattered across 10, even 15 different study sections, get a really good understanding of the, of the nuances and the kinds of applications that may be most appropriate for, for any. We do see within DIRH more and more of these kind of hybrid studies that, was, that were mentioned yesterday, where they're, they're sort of um, trying to answer questions about the effectiveness of interventions while informing implementation. So that is a committee that's been receptive to that. Um, but I think a lot of it comes down to, I would always start with, here are, the, here are the key questions that I'm most interested in answering. Let program staff help to identify the right place. I think it can be a challenge to try and fit a particular study section, especially if it's not quite what you want to do. So I think there's enough, as, as Amy had said, there's enough diversity among the different study sections and history of seeing different permutations with different levels of influence of, say, intervention effectiveness or efficacy with implementation, that I think the, probably the better thing is to have that individual discussion and then they can help. Also, you know, as Amy had said, some uh, expertise may be uh, more in abundance on some study sections than others, and it's a good consideration. So there's not a perfect answer, but the best thing to do is send concept papers, have that dialogue, and say, here's what I'm thinking. And then, in your cover letter, you absolutely have the right to specify, this is the committee that I think makes the most sense for the following reasons. And that at least makes it easier for the referral offices to say, OK, well, that makes sense. If it doesn't, of course, they have the discretion to go elsewhere. But it makes it easier to engage in the dialogue if you've said, here's what we think, here's where we think it should go.